This is Warren Vanderhill with the Center for Middletown Studies project on uh, school consolidation. And today I'm speaking with Mark Burkhart, the Emeritus Chief Financial Officer for the Muncie Community Schools. The date is January 8th, 2015. Mark, I want to begin by thanking you for participating in our project. And just to get this on the record, I want to begin by a simple question. When did you become the school system's Chief Financial Officer? Uh, I was uh, overnight in 1985. Uh, the previous uh, person in this position was uh, released, relieved of his duties, and the next morning I came in and I was a business manager. It was in January of '85. Okay. And then you served how long? So you retired. And came I back. retired in uh, 2010 and uh, came back uh, for four years, and uh, actually I'm back right now temporarily because the the current uh, the the most recent, uh, the person that replaced me uh, in 2014 uh, left suddenly, and so here I am again. Okay. Well, to get right to the heart of hearts on this, as you look back, when did it become obvious, apparent to you that the school system would have to close a high school, specifically Southside? Well, uh, if, if you're talking about Southside and the, the most recent history, um, in uh, 2005, there was a, a shift at the state level in terms of leadership. And uh, beginning that year, uh, school funding uh, took a, a very dramatic turn uh, for urban districts. Uh, up until that time, the school funding formula had a provision in it called the minimum guarantee. And that basically, in layman's terms, meant that Whatever a school district got in their basic grant, their tuition support formula the previous year, you couldn't get any less than that the next year. Regardless of whether your enrollment went up or down or whatever, you're never going to get less than what you got the previous year. 2005, uh, the General Assembly and the governor removed that from the formula. There was still a, a, a safeguard in the formula, and that was called the, the degoster, or some people call it the regoster. Uh, they retained in the, in the uh, formula that year uh, a provision that if you did lose a student, the next year you only lost 20% of that student's uh, funding. Right. And so you had five years. You had a five-year phase-out of a student, 20% a year over five years. And that was called a degoster or a regoster. And uh, two years later, when they came back, they had the General Assembly and the governor, they had second thoughts about that five-year phase out. And so they lowered it to three years. So from that point on, we lost a third, a third, a third, until the, the child was out of our count completely. Uh, two years later, they removed it entirely. And so in 2009, the, uh, when a child is no longer in our uh, enrollment, we lose the funding immediately. Uh, that enrollment at that point, and for all of those years prior to that, was taken every September. Uh, this past year, in 2014, we started taking enrollment twice a year. So uh, the General Assembly now has an opportunity to reduce our uh, school district's funding twice a year. Uh, they do it in September now and in February, and most districts, not just urban districts, have uh, students that leave at the semester, uh, they, they graduate the, the middle of their senior year and they want to go on to school. And so those, in the past, we've been able to still retain those in our annual count. But now that we're counting in uh, February also, uh, we lose those dollars. Uh, currently, the Muncie Schools gets about 63 to 60, a little bit between 63 and 6400 dollars per student. And so, uh, you know, if we lose one, that's uh, significant. That degoster, the concept of the degoster was that if a district like Muncie, we have 500 teachers in Muncie, a little, little less than 500 now, but uh, if we lose 100 students, that's, that's less than one student per classroom. So losing those 100 students in one year, it's kind of hard to reduce a significant number of faculty in one year, and so they gave us five years under the five-year plan. Then they reduced it to three. Now it's immediate. And so uh, we no longer have a lot of lead time to respond to the losses in uh, population and in, in, uh, enrollment. 
not, at least not the time that we had previously. But in, in 2005, we saw the change in the minimum guarantee. We saw the change in the uh, de-ghoster or re-ghoster start at that time. Uh, later then, uh, we saw the um, uh, implementation of circuit breaker tax caps, which started in 2009. And uh, uh, one of the things that's unique about the Muncie schools that has caused the tax cap, the impact of the tax caps to be very significant, is we only are able to tax half of our total tax base. Our tax base, our net tax base in Muncie is 1.6 billion. If you took the total assessed value of the entire school district, it would be well over $3 billion. We only get to tax half of it. And that causes the tax rate to be higher than it might be in some other districts. Uh, any place that has a very high tax rate is going to be impacted more significantly than otherwise by circuit breaker tax caps. And so uh, the reason, as you might, if you think about it for a moment, the reason that our, uh, we are only able to tax half of our tax base, half of our assessed value, is because we're one township with two very large parcels that are untaxed, Ball State and Ball Hospital. And that forces the rate up for everybody else. And uh, that kicks in the circuit breakers. One other thing that happened that has led up to the closing of Southside, and it's all based on school finance, um, is what, what the school folks, uh, school business people call the midnight massacre. In December, late December, and I believe it was December the 28th of 2009, the same year that the caps started. Of course, we had just entered the recession. Gov the governor at the time, on December 28, 2009, announced that there was a rescission in the state appropriation for school funding that would take effect three days later, on January the 1st. He, took, he chopped $300 million from the school funding formula. Uh, and never, it was never placed back in the formula, ever. It isn't in there today. That one step on December 28, 2009, Muncie Schools lost $2.6 million in that one action. And of course, if you follow any of that, you know that shortly after that was done, they found $300 million in somebody's desk drawer in Indianapolis, and, but it was never restored. But so, I mean, this really is then a tale um, to quote the old cliche, follow the money. Absolutely. And the, the money is the compelling point here. Yeah. It, it's it's, it's uh, uh, based on dollars. It's a, it's a financial decision entirely. So, so it's fair to say then that from someone looking at this from your perspective, the bottom line perspective, it was simply inevitable that at some point that high school was going to close. Uh, that was my view all along. Yeah. Um, the... Um, the numbers still haven't, uh, you know, we, we, we closed that school, we started the current school year, 14-15 academic year, mm -hmm. and uh, compared the September count, I mentioned a little while ago, right. our September count this year compared to our se September count last year is down 487, okay. 487 students, which is a lot higher okay. loss than we normally would see in one year, yeah. so there's been some uh, out migration. There's been some some uh, people that have fled because of the um, the closing of the school. Yeah. But those, those aren't all people out of that school. No, 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 absolutely not. No, we would normally have, and I I, I have some uh, enrollment history here. We would normally have about a hundred students per year. I'd say a year in and year out, it would be down about a hundred students, yeah. uh, putting aside the closing of the high school. But 400 is a big number. It is, absolutely. Especially when you're talking about a school population that now is less than 6,000. That's right. Yeah. If, you, if you consider that 400, 400 and whatever I said there, 487 times $6,300 per student. Yeah, that's a big chunk. Yeah. Now, to put a little bit different, 
or to approach this from a little bit different angle. Do you just think, as you look back, that the public in this community really grasps the system's financial plight? Um, I, I think they, they've heard us say enough that there's a problem, but I, and we probably should uh, take some of the blame for this. I think there's a, a high level of, uh, there's a lack of, of knowledge, there's a lack of information about the, uh, how, the extent of that issue. Uh, it, it materialized in the results of a referendum a year ago. Uh, uh, we lost the referendum. We were, we were attempting to uh, establish a, a, uh, an exempt tax rate that would not be subject to the tax caps, uh, primarily to fund school bus operations, but uh, it failed. Uh, part of the reason it failed was perhaps because we didn't sell it the way we should have. Uh, part of the reason it failed is because we were considering closing a school at the same time we tried to get support for the referendum. And that's probably the bigger, yeah. the bigger uh, yeah. cause, in terms of cause and effect, that's probably the bigger cause. Do you think as you look back again that there were really any viable alternatives to closing the South Side? The reason I bring this up is in interviewing school board members, a number of them in the course of the interviews with me talked about things like a 712 option or trying to put all the students at the South Side. We, uh, we, we, our Blue Ribbon Task Force uh, considered uh, all configurations. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if you look at the state of Indiana, uh, most of the schools in the state of Indiana are 7 through 12 right. secondary schools, right. but most of them are rural. Yeah. And they don't have the demographic mix that we have here. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have not only participated as the financial officer for the district in the closing of Southside, I was a, a, the financial officer when we closed Northside. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, at, you know, we've gone through periods uh, where we have moved uh, the sixth grade into the middle schools mm -hmm. and just reconfiguring grade levels in a school is, is a very traumatic uh, process. The Those, word, just the word I was going to use. A lot, lot of resistance to that. So, you know, uh, the concept of moving uh, the middle schools and the high schools together and putting them all under one roof, um, there, there was a lot of uh, concern about that, yeah. as, as you would expect. Yeah. And uh, so that became uh, not the most viable of options that we we thought about, but we we looked at it certainly, and yeah. and it's not an unusual configuration. Like I say, in Indiana, you're going to find a lot of those districts. I want to ask you how you think that uh, we talked about the tax caps. You could talk more about that in the context of this question, but I'd like to have you address ways in which state policy decisions really made in Indianapolis have filtered down to impact the school system. You mentioned the tax caps, but the other two I want to toss at you would be charter schools and vouchers. Mm -hmm. How how have those? I mean, I guess to me, this is kind of like the triple whammy. I mean, you not only have the tax caps, you also have to deal with some different thinking, shall we say, on the part of leadership in Indianapolis. That well, okay, we're also going to have charter schools. That goes back to the time I was in Ball State in the '90s. But we're also going to have vouchers, and every year it seems they want to expand the voucher system. So if you look at it from tax caps one, vouchers two, charter schools three, and just comment on how some of those things. Well, you're just talking about uh, taking money away from public schools. That, that, that's what it all yeah. amounts to in total, taking money away from public schools. Yeah. I, I, think, I think those, and I don't, I don't speak for anyone but myself, yeah, but right, right. Um, I, I think the folks who are in charge of running our public schools in Indiana can uh, accept a concept of vouchers going to public schools. Right. You know, if a if a child if a parents of a child if that child resides in the Muncie Community School District, and for whatever reason that parent and that child wants to go to a an adjacent school district a public school. Um, I think I think we can accept that right. without without much resistance. But 
because that, that other public school is held to the same standards that the Muncie Community Schools is held to. Their teachers have to be properly credentialed. They have to administer the same testing program that we have to administer. Uh, however, if those dollars are, are uh, flowing to private or parochial schools, and in most cases, the, in many cases, that's where those dollars are flowing, um, those are the, 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 the expectations for, for those particular institutions aren't the same. They, their credentialing is not the same. Their testing programs are not the same. Uh, every year, uh, and it'll happen here uh, probably in February each year, uh, every public school has to publish its performance report in the local paper as a legal advertisement. You will not see any parochial schools publishing those reports. Actually, just as an aside, you will not see the report for Burris Laboratory School. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think uh, in terms of charter schools and vouchers and so on, uh, public school administrators don't necessarily have an issue with school choice, which means that that, that parent can decide whatever public school they want their child to go to. But if it, if it is a decision to go to a school that is not held to the same standards that the public school, and of course, another point is many of those charter schools and private schools and parochial schools can uh, present information that shows that their performance is better than the public schools, but they also have one other option at those schools. They can reject enrollment. Yeah, right. They can reject. We, we take whoever comes through the door with the baggage that they bring with them. Uh, when you have in Muncie over 75% of the students at risk on free and reduced lunch, which is the definition of a risk yeah. uh, in, in Indiana, um, they, they bring a lot, of, lot with them from home every day. And we have to deal with those uh, issues. So um, I do have a distaste for uh, vouchers that are uh, provided universally mm -hmm. to all institutions, regardless of the operational, mm -hmm. uh, the procedures in those institutions, uh, perhaps not being uh, at the same level as public school. When you talk about these reports, I want to go back. Are you talking about the reports about school performance that are published in the newspaper? Because yeah. Burris is in there. Well, but you, you, you might find Burris listed, but you won't find every criteria. It, oh. There'll be a lot of blanks in the Burris yeah. uh, report. Because Indiana Academy is in there, too. Yeah, it, and I think, uh, yeah, the Indiana Academy is in there. Right. Well, the charter school movement that I participated in to some degree when the uh -huh. started to get involved in charters, has that really had much of an impact on the Muncie Community Schools? I, mean, I think the vouchers may have, but I'm not so sure the charters have. Yeah, the charters, I, I'm very pleased with uh, the way the uh, stakeholders in Muncie have responded to charters. Uh, they really haven't embraced them. Right. Uh, we, have, we have a charter school now in the old Garfield Elementary right. School. Right. It's called Inspire Academy. Yeah. It started out... Um, a year ago, uh, it started out in the fall of 13, I believe, uh, with about uh, 100, a uh, little over 100 students. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's I, my understanding they're now down to around 60, between 50 and 60 students mm -hmm. in that facility. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of disenchantment on the part of the, the parents that sent them there originally, so they they pulled them out. I, I think, you know, maybe, maybe I'm reading this wrong, yeah. but... Um, when people, uh, when, when uh, parents and guardians elect to send their children to a, a charter school, they're basically saying they think they'll get a better education, I think, in that charter school. And uh, uh, charter schools had been around uh, several years. You would know better than I when they started, but several years before the Inspire Academy ever kicked in. And so it took that long for anybody to really get that going in, in Muncie to be competitive. You know, there are some neighboring communities where there are a bunch of charter schools. Anderson has several charter schools. And Fort Wayne. And Fort Wayne, yeah. So so I, I don't know if I'm reading too much into that that delayed uh, implementation of charters in Muncie, but I, I think it's a, a good message. I think St. Lawrence operates as a charter. 
I, I think it is too. Yeah. Yeah. I, now, I don't think yeah. they did until recently. Go back to Inspire. I mean, I don't know much about it. And I get the question, so I have here you here. Maybe you can tell me. What is the educational philosophy of Inspire? I, I couldn't tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's it has something. It's on the sign okay. out in front of the school, so you might want to drive by and and read what's on that sign. <laughs> their their uh, their 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 statement is on there. So when we go back to the building, because you know something about that, how how do you get a building? Like how did they get Garfield to have a charter school there? Well, the Garfield Elementary School, uh, under the state uh, standardized, uh, standardized testing program, was a failing school. Okay. And uh, uh, Eric King was a previous superintendent right. here. Dr. King said, uh, we, you know, you have so many years to improve a school, and then you have to take some other step. Right. And one of the things that a district can do if a school doesn't improve within that time period is close it. Right. And so Dr. King elected to close that oh, school. Okay. And uh, concurrently with closing that school, uh, rather than distributing those students among the nearest other elementary schools, uh, we came up with the concept of an academy reopening the old East Washington right. Street, right. Uh, Washington Carver School, yeah. and making it uh, not only a regular education program for the students from the old Garfield district, but putting our high ability yeah. students in there together with those other students. And uh, it, it's, it's been a, a, an excellent uh, uh, decision. Um, so by starting a brand new school, all of that history from Garfield was gone. It was wiped out and we started fresh with East, East Washington Academy. Uh, Garfield then was vacant for about a year and um, this is, uh, we now have uh, the state, uh, another thing that the General Assembly has done is they've, they've uh, created a, a vacated school registry and whenever you close a school you have to put the yeah. school on that registry so that any charter school in the state can claim it for a dollar. And, uh, uh, but the, the Garfield closing was before that registry was in place. And so um, we had the building appraised. I, I'm thinking it was like $135,000. The appraisal on, on schools, empty schools, is not very high. Uh, there's not a lot of market for empty school buildings. And so um, the uh, Muncie Housing Authority had been in the process of tearing down all of the uh, housing projects on South Madison Street and bu building individual uh, structures, uh, individual homes to replace them. And so they needed to find a facility, to, and, and part of that process was de uh, uh, demolishing the old uh, South Madison Street Center recreation center. And so here was Garfield School block away, and they said, you know, uh, that might be a, an option for us. And so uh, the Muncie Housing Authority bought that from the school board at the appraised value. They, uh, there had been talk about building a brand new Unity Center in Hecan Park to replace the South Madison Recreation Center. They never could get the funding for that. And so now the Garfield School has become the Unity Center. And uh, it's not the same Unity Center concept that was originally uh, on the table. They had talked about putting Boys and Girls Club in the new Unity Center with a, in a new building. And uh, there may be some long-term uh, plan to incorporate the Boys and Girls Club next door to the Garfield building into the Unity Center, into the old Garfield School. I don't know. The Inspire Academy then uh, needed space. And so, uh, they went to the Housing Authority and they rent space from the Muncie Housing Authority in Garfield School in order to have so their... So the school system has really no connection? No, none whatsoever. No. In your time as the school system's CFO, what role do you think that the local business community played in school policy decisions? Uh, I think... Um, when, when I became the business manager in, in 1985, the, the, uh, we at that time had a, a another, it wasn't called a Blue Ribbon Task Force, but it was a group of about 20 uh, leaders in the community, many bank presidents, uh, uh, 
uh, foundation officers uh, and other community leaders who were helping us. The reason why the my the person that preceded me as business manager was relieving his duties is because of a, a deficit that came up uh, unannounced in our general fund at the at the end of 1984, and so. Uh, the superintendent of the time, Don Slaughter, created this uh, task force to help us c get that under control and turn that around. And uh, they also then uh, were very involved as we uh, considered in that period of time uh, closing Northside High School, and, uh, which we did in 1988. And, uh, and which a lot of those people had a lot of interest. They did. They had some vested interest in that in that particular. And it was a tough decision. Closing a school is a tough. It's yeah. it's tough. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, we've we've always in, uh, tried to incorporate. Now right now, um, there is a, an effort going on to uh, create a, a financial advisory group, resurrect that group, if you will. Yeah to help us because of those things I listed earlier yeah. that have been impacting us the last 10 years. Um, I think all of those things that have been handed to us by the General Assembly since 2005, we would have a much better, uh, much better uh, be able to deal with those had they not come so quickly. But to have all of that dumped on us in a 10 year period uh, has really been tough. And so now we, uh, we currently have a, um, a facility study, a physical plant study underway. We should, within the month, have some results. That's also going to include a, uh, which you perhaps have discussed this with others, but it's going to include some enrollment projections for us, some demographic numbers uh, to let us look at, you know, how many, how many schools do we need in the future? And if so, then what what's, might be the next school that we would close, or the next schools that we would close? And so that'll be interesting to see that. And then those that, uh, uh, I think the determination on if we close any schools, what schools do we close, will be based probably on the condition of the physical plan in each of those schools, which ones are going to require the most renovation uh, if we're going to keep it. And those that are the most uh, in need of renovation probably will be the ones we target for closing rather than investing more money. How, how do you think that the school system fits into the larger context of economic development and community like this? Oh, I, I think, you know, the, 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 the image of the school district uh, I think is very important to the community as it tries to sell itself to potential investors in the community, absolutely. But what is the community? Is the community uh, Muncie? Is the community Delaware County? Is the community East Central Indiana? Uh, what is that community that, that those investors are looking at? Uh, I think we've got an excellent school district here. If people really look at the, at the details, if they really dig in and look at, at the, the community that we serve, I, I think we do an excellent job uh, but we have, we just have an overwhelming number of challenges that have uh, presented themselves in a very short period of time. But back to your question, yeah. there's no doubt about the, 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 the image that is projected by the, the school district is very important. I'll be very interested to see what the head of the chamber has to yeah. say about that. I, I would assume he'd yeah. concur. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd like to ask you the same question about the involvement of local political parties. How has that played out during the time you were a CFO? Well, uh, just just from observation, uh, obviously uh, our school board elections are uh, nonpartisan, if you will. Uh, but uh, over those uh, many years that I've been in Muncie and, and worked for the Muncie Community Schools, I came in 1970, and and so you know here, 45 years now. Uh, there's, there's always been some um, involvement on the school board and in the operation of the schools, although I would commend both parties. They've not, they've not uh, mandated, they've not come down particularly hard on the district to do this or else. Um, 
uh, we, uh, we probably should have worked a little more closely with both of them when we did the referendum because yeah. they probably could have helped us educate the, the voters and got, got, got people to the polls. And, you know, we had such a low turnout. Right. Um, uh, so, it, it, you know, I think we probably could, could have sought their help on, a, on a, 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 perhaps a neutral basis, but at least sought their help in, in selling that. But uh, I haven't, uh, I think you might see a little more in a, a larger urban area than, than ours. You might see more involvement of the political parties. But I haven't really seen anything that was, uh, we haven't been able to deal with. Yeah, I would agree with you. I, I think it becomes a big deal in a community like Indianapolis, mm -hmm. and to some degree in a place like Fort Wayne. But I, I mean, going back as far as you do, I don't think there's been a lot of overt political no. party involvement in I, I don't either. school board elections. I don't either, no. Some of the uh, school board members see now having one high school as a really positive force for economic development. Single school, unified, single mission, offering more diverse academic programs and things. Do you think that's... I concur. Right? I think that is right on. Okay. Uh, I think it, it has unified the community. I'm sorry that those 487 yeah. people yeah. didn't necessarily agree with that, yeah. uh, but uh, I think it has unified. We came up when the when the decision was made and we started the transition. We came up with a slogan, "One Muncie." Right. The mayor has now embraced that, yeah. Yeah. and it's every place, and that's great. I think I, I think that's the direction we've got to go. Um, Ball uh, Foundation, Ball Brothers Foundation right. helped us with that, right. and and uh, I think I think the people that uh, understand how communities operate, they concur with that, and they have bought into that concept. And I, I think it'll take a little time. It's it's nothing that's going to happen overnight, but I think uh, ultimately it's going to be uh, uh, very uh, positive for this community. Mm -hmm. As Muncie has experienced deindustrialization over the last couple of decades, this process has obviously had a significant impact on the schools with the loss of jobs, you have a loss of students. Do you think the student numbers can go back up without the employment picture in Muncie changing? It's unlikely. One of the things that I've observed, uh, Muncie is a one township school district, densely populated, practically totally developed. Mm -hmm. Any, you know, the housing patterns that I've observed over the, the 45 years I've been here, uh, part of our loss of students is the result of uh, young families wanting newer housing stock. Your newer additions are outside of our district. Right. We have, that's just the way it is, yeah. because that's where the undeveloped land is, that's where the, the developers buy the land and start building those newer homes. So part of that loss of students has been as a result of where those new housing additions are. It really wasn't uh, because people were trying to build outside of the Muncie School District. That's just where the undeveloped land was. And so I don't, you know, unless there's some, uh, uh, some uh, dramatic change in, in uh, uh, the, the attitude of, of these families that have school-aged children, I don't know that we'll see them coming back in to the city. Uh, I don't, I guess it could, could happen. Uh, the housing stock would have to improve and it, it'd have to be attractive to those folks to move back into the community. Uh, I know there is, a, there is, I read a lot about people moving back into yeah. towns, but it's, it's generally from the reading I've done, it's, it's not people with families, it's singles and young, uh, young marriages without families and so on, and professionals and, yeah. and so on. So uh, I really don't see the, the enrollment growing that much uh, in the future, but we would like to see it bottom out and, and not decrease any, any further. Um, the decision to make, uh, to go to three high schools right. was made in 1967 at a board meeting in 1967, the decision to build Northside High School. And we had 20,000 students. Right. It was 19,000 yeah. something. Yeah. And uh, almost immediately after that, it started going the other direction. Yeah. Even before Northside ever opened, yeah. 
it started going the other direction. And uh, now I would say that within that 19,000 or 20,000, you had 600 students at Burris, High School, Burris Laboratory School that were counted in that 20 because they were our students and we paid Ball State right. to educate. We paid the tuition for Ball State to, to educate those students. Um, we, we opened Northside in 1970. 1973, we opened Central High School and um, uh, uh, gave notice to Ball State University that we would no longer be paying the tuition for those 600 students to go to Burris because we had room for them. And as you know, uh, Ball State then took the initiative to create their own school district right. and continue to run a Burris. So we, that one year, we lost 600 students out of our enrollment just by right. uh, a piece of paper yeah. transaction. Right. Uh, but the, the enrollment has continued to drop until now we're down just a little below 6,000 uh, students. Now, uh, the, our, our official enrollment uh, needs to be addressed just slightly here. We are the uh, educate, educating agency for vocational ed for four counties and for uh, special education for uh, two counties. Right. And so uh, we get a lot of students over and above our 6,000. We have a lot of students coming to us every day for which we have to hire teachers, we have to have classrooms, we have to have all of these ancillary services for those students. Uh, they're not counted in our official enrollment, but in fact, we have to accept the fact that they are students being educated in the Muncie Community Schools, and their home districts pay us uh, to do that. So uh, we actually right now have, uh, uh, um, let's see, we have this year 6,600 students in the Muncie School. When you count all, when you count all of the students that... Uh, you know, come from outside. Mm -hmm. This is the last question I have, and then you can add anything that, that you wish. Well, let me no, let me let me just throw something else in there. During our preliminary conversation, you were talking about, and I'd like to get this on the record, the changes that have occurred over the last few decades in the largest taxing areas in the community. So, just to get this on the record, if you go back, let's say, 20 years, what would be the largest taxing? We we uh, uh, we have a report that's uh, generated every year that uh, we get from the county auditor that tells us who our ten largest taxpayers are in the district. Twenty years ago, it would have been dominated by manufacturing. Okay. Today, it's dominated by utilities and uh, retail, mm -hmm. and uh, and surprisingly, some uh, college housing. <laughs> is in there too. But there's no manufacturing. I mean, the manufacturing is gone. And that's been the case for the last uh, several years. And so that, that's a very, uh, uh, that's very dramatic evidence of the, of the change that has occurred in our tax base. Along with your two largest employers not being, shall we say, significant tax units. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> Namely, IU Health and the University. And the University. And you know what? We don't we don't complain about that yeah. because they they give the community stability. Sure. Having yeah. the university and the hospital here has been great during this recession. Mm -hmm. And I hate to think of what the community would look like without them. Oh, yeah. But our taxpayers have to understand that by wiping all of that assessed value off the tax base, the tax rates are higher than they would be in some other district they're comparing us to and the circuit breaker tax cap losses are significantly higher. We lost, we lose 40% of our tax levy every year to tax caps. We only get 60% of what the state has approved for us as a property tax levy, 60%. And that affects uh, the way we run school buses. It affects how we can repair leaky roofs or drippy faucets or uh, broken toilets or, you know, uh, we just can't do the things that we need to do on the schedule we need to do those things because we're losing that 40% of our levy. Our total levy last year was $18 million. Uh, whatever 60% of that is, that's what we received. And uh, so so it is, it is uh, 
very significant to us, uh, the, the tax caps. And of course, they're in the Constitution now. They're not going, it's going, we have to live with that. This is also a question just to get back in here. But since you were the person with the finances at the time Northside closed, mm -hmm. why do you think that the closing of Northside was nowhere near as traumatic to this community as the closing of Southside? Oh, it was traumatic. I, I, I have a theory on Maybe this. I'm just okay. Yeah, I, and you, you, you'll be interested in this. Um, we had, uh, we didn't have a, as many town hall meetings as we had with <laughs> closing, sure. so we didn't subject ourselves to that kind of uh, uh, attack Public back then. Meetings. But we had, we had board meetings, regular board meetings that we opened up for discussion. And we had to move those to auditoriums because they were so, uh, there were so many people uh, wanting to, to voice their opinion about the possibility of closing. Um, the, the decision was made, we, we, we made the decision to close south in uh, December, and it closed at the end of that next school year in June, that school year in June, that same school year. The decision to close Northside was made at a board meeting in January, of 1988, and it closed in May of 1988, or perhaps June, I don't know how late the school year went. Every meeting up to that decision in January was packed. Uh, for two months after that meeting, that decision was made, every meeting was packed. In March of 1988, something happened. March of 1988. That was that year we closed Northside. They caused the crowds to thin out. Central won the state basketball oh, yeah. tournament. Now this is the truth. Really? We were able to go back to our regular meeting place at that point. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's hard to believe that that would have been a, a factor that people that played into that. But that that's the way it played out. Well, it was almost a kind of, like, Turning a switch? Did that just they said, oh, well, I don't know what the, the mindset was, but I, I, I'm thinking that people said, okay. And the Northside folks said, we get to go to the state championship high school now next year. Here we go. And you know, if they, if they were athletic minded yeah. and thinking about athletics, they were thinking, okay, let's go over here. <laughs> it's a great thesis. The only thing that happened after that that was in response at commencement for Northside High School. At the night of commencement, as the students took all of the silverware from Northside, and as they walked across the stage to get their uh, diploma, Owen and Limna would shake their hand and they'd drop a knife or a fork or a spoon on the table. And so he ended up with this big pile of uh, stuff. What a wonderful <laughs> image. So, Finally, then, last but by no means least, as you look back, do you think that the leaders of the school system did enough to prepare the community for what was coming in these school closings? And I guess it's still coming. And I'm talking now about oh, superintendents, school board members. I mean, you, you've got some great history here. And I'm always concerned about how much you can do to try to prepare people for we really have to take a long, hard look at this. This is probably what's going to happen. How, how do you see Well, that? of course, the decisions are made by the school board. Right. And, but they, they depend on a number of other folks to uh, counsel them and, and direct them. Um, in hindsight, if we can have do-overs, sure, sure. you know, there would be a lot of things. You know, would we have built Northside? If we, knew yeah. that, if we knew that enrollment yeah. was immediately yeah. going to start going this direction. Great historical point. Would... Would we have built a new Wilson Middle School out here? Yeah. Would we have just said, you know, instead of building a new Wilson Middle School, let's just make Southside a middle school. That would have happened in 95 rather than this year. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the building of the, of, of the middle school was done because where and where it was, I, I, you know, I sat in on those sessions. Um, the the four laning of 67 around 
uh, here yeah. and access to Interstate 69. They thought that was going to open that corridor up and there was going to be a lot of development out there. Yeah. Let's put that middle school over there and take advantage of all that development. That just didn't pan out. Pan out. Sure. And, uh, you know, the, the decision to build Northside, even though some questioned it, even some lawsuits questioned that, but um, probably at the time, we, we our enrollment, they were running three shifts at the old Muncie Central. Kids coming in at eight, nine, and uh, seven, eight, and nine o'clock, and then getting out in shifts, and uh, so that probably was a logical decision to make at that at that point. But then looking back, you know, we could have avoided that. <laughs> Actually, I would say something about we we've kept track over the years. I came in 1970 and to the Muncie schools. We have closed 26 facilities since that year yeah. and um, but we we've, we've added three so the net result is we've closed about 23 net so we're closing about uh, every two years we're closing a facility on average and uh, I think I think that's been very um, fiscally responsible uh, the the board uh, closing schools tough and we said that before but we had to adjust to the lost revenue that was coming as a result of lost enrollment. And the board did that. They made some tough decisions. Some of them have been good decisions, some of them have been bad decisions. Uh, or questionable decisions, right. you know. But they made the decision based on what they had in front of them at that, at that moment. And uh, um, we, uh, you know, we, we tried to administer and implement those things that, that they wanted to do. When we opened Central High School in 1973 and, and told Burris we yeah. were going to take those kids back, that didn't, you know, that, 1973 was a very big year for public education. Uh, Central opened here, the Career Center opened in 1973, federal government passed a piece of a legislation called the Individuals with Disabilities yeah. Education Act, IDEA. And from that point on, we had to provide a full uh, complement of instructional programming for disabled students, for uh, uh, special needs students. Before, before that time, all of our special needs programming was in the old Morrison Mock School and in the old Jefferson Elementary School basement. Uh, big, big uh, change that happened there. In 1973, uh, the state uh, general assembly passed uh, public law 217, which is the teacher collective bargaining law. Up until then, teacher unions were not recognized. From that point on, we had to collectively bargain with uh, with all of the teachers. So, uh, 1973 was a big shift in public schools generally, but in Muncie in particular, because not only we did we have the special ed legislation and the public bargaining law. But we had central opening, the career center opening, the loss of Burroughs students. It was just a big change for us that particular year. Well, I want to thank you for this. And if you have anything else that you'd like to add, I really would appreciate it. It's been, uh, been terrific. No, I'll be anxious to see what history. the final product looks like. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. You bet. You bet. Thank you.